Hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand oh, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this new session of RBI 24/7. So guys, I hope you all are doing really well and for this day as you know that in this sessions we discuss a set of five questions that can be of use to you if you are preparing for competitive exams. So let's not waste any time and move straight away to question number 1, but before doing that, let me ask you to subscribe to our channel. So those of you who watch these sessions daily must have got into a habit of a habit uh, to listen to this so uh, do not forget to subscribe to our channel if you are watching it for the very first time and you can also press this bell icon which is flashing here on the screen it can help you to go get notified whenever a new video comes up right you can also join our telegram group on this group you can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible so guys here is question number 1 for today i hope the screen is perfectly visible it talks about some situations right so there are some situations and you have to tell in which of these situations can bank merger be an appropriate strategy so guys bank merger is nothing short of a wedding right so uh, let's see what the solution is the correct option for this question is option b option b means one and 2 1 and 2 so as i was talking that a bank merger you can easily compare it to a wedding just as a bride and a bridegroom they have to adjust and accommodate to in order to stay happy together similarly two banks if they are getting merged into one entity then obviously they have to make certain adjustments certain accommodations and there are as just like a wedding there are uh, also some pros pros and some cons to this merger right so this has been picked up from one of your comments on the videos in which you asked me to take up the reasons behind bank merger so i hope this helps you so talking about the first situation bank x an established bank with a huge consumer base looks to develop its digital operations like the young banks are doing nowadays so basically there is an old bank which is established so obviously it must be having trust in uh, among its consumer base right but where it is lacking it is lacking into technology it wants to digitize it, its operations it wants to learn something new now in case it gets merged with a young bank or let's say with a bank which is having or uh, which is doing some sort of breakthrough in fintech innovation then it can be really helpful for these two banks to merge you can just understand it as the situation of helping an old person to cope up with technology just as we all help out our parents uh, or grandparents in order to tell them so uh, i think आप सबने ये फेस किया होगा कभी ना कभी अपने पेरेंट्स को या अपने ग्रैंड पेरेंट्स को बताना कि एक व्हाट्सएप को कैसे फॉरवर्ड करना है या फिर यूट्यूब पे कोई वीडियो कैसे चलाना है या फिर अगर उनको यूट्यूब पे कोई बहुत पुराना गाना सुनना है तो दीज आर दिचुएशन वी ऑल वी ऑल हैव फेस्ड इन आर लाइफ टाइम राइट सो जस्ट एज वी हेल्प देम टू लर्न दिस टेक्नोलॉजी इन सिमिलर वे दिस यंग बैंक विच हैज staff which is working into fintech innovation can help this established bank now what is in this deal for this young bank the experience of an old and established bank when you tell your parents or grandparents uh, in uh, the knowledge to work out technology in return they tell you or they give you wisdom they give you knowledge from their life's past experiences similarly this old established bank can help this young bank get the customer base because the customer base has trust on this old bank that is why using this trust this old established bank can ask its customers to trust the technology of young bank right so in this way with this mutual mutual benefit of both the sides they can work out right so first situation can be an appropriate situation for a for a merger now second situation abc bank has a presence all over northern india and it is looking to expand in southern india as well right similar sort of situation there is a bank which has presence in north india and looking 
to establish in southern india right so if it merges with a bank which which enjoys trust of people living in the southern part of country this southern bank can also get benefit from merging from this north bank right because they both can uh, get access to each other's geographical boundaries so in this way they can expand right so that is why this can also be a situation for merger now third point says bank w has a unique work culture which is quite different from the other banks in the industry now we have got a weird bank right so now this weird bank is having some different sort of attitude so it can be really difficult for it to accommodate or adjust with any other bank right so just as in a wedding if one person is not willing to adjust or is having some different sort of attitude than a normal person or is in simple sense a weird person then it becomes difficult to adjust right so jis tarike se shaadi mein ek ek shaadi mein adjust karne mein difficulty hoti hai agar ek person adjust na karna chahe usi tarike se is bank ko bhi dikkat ho sakti hai so that is why this might not be a very good situation for merger right so i hope this uh, these are some reasons uh, and you can figure out the reasons behind these situations moving ahead that is why 1 and 2 can be correct answers okay here are some advantages and disadvantages disadvantages of getting married first of all advantages reduces the cost of operations obviously two people living in separate houses right if they live together then obviously they can save up on their money so basically they can have benefit of economies of scale right so one benefit of getting married the other one merger helps in financial inclusion and broadening the geographical reach of the banking right just as we saw in the examples npa and risk management are benefited see the point is whatever is lacking in one person can be fulfilled by the other partner right so this is the uh, this this is the fundamentals these are the fundamentals of a good marriage or of a successful marriage that both the partners they try to fulfill the deformities or basically uh, whatever are the deficiencies of each of these persons can be fulfilled by their partner right so in banking also if we say that one partner is really wealthy and the other one is poor then obviously this poor one can have benefit or they both can share the wealth right in this situation the poor person can make the ends meet by getting married to a wealthy person in similar in similar sense a poor bank or a bank which is facing financial difficulties which is witnessing a huge amount of npas it can get help if it combines with a wealthy bank right so wealthy bank might be having some incentives like uh, access to some geographical locations that this poor bank has right so there must be something for this wealthy bank into this deal right so leads to availability of bigger scale of expertise helps in minimizing the scope of inefficiency right which is more in small banks merger sees a bigger capital base just as i told you higher liquidity that reduces government's burden of recapitalizing the public sector banks so let's say this poor person is really homeless doesn't even have a home for living and this wealthy person this person is having a bungalow to live in so now if they both get married then government wouldn't have to worry about this homeless person because this person has found accommodation into this wealthy person right so this can relieve the government of making amends or making some uh, adjustments for this poor person this relieves or relieves the burden of government so this can be a useful situation now coming to disadvantages of a merger first of all many banks have regional audience and cater to merger destroys the idea of decentralization basically some banks they work into a niche industry or this they serve a particular set of customers or see ye jo chote banks hote hain kai bar ye ek limited set of customers ko hi services provide karte hain jo ki ek particular area se belong karte hain aur jab ye bade level pe aate hain to ye itna successful 
नहीं हो पाते हैं सो समाइम्स वेन द स्केल इज इंक्रीज दी स्मॉल बैंक दे कैन हैव प्रॉब्लम इन एडजस्टिंग टू दी इन एडजस्टिंग टू दी वर्क एनवायरमेंट ऑफ बिगर बैंक राइट और दे आर जस्ट यूज टू सर्विंग अ पर्टिकुलर सेट ऑफ कस्टमर्स सेकेंड लार्जर बैंक माइट बी मोर वेबल टू इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस वाइल्ड स्मॉलर वन कैन सर्वाइव समटाइम्स दिस ऑल्सो हैपन द बिगर दी एंटरप्राइज द मोर दे आर एक्सपोज टू एन पी एस देखो जितना बड़ा बैंक होगा उतना ही ज्यादा उन्होंने लोन दिया होगा उतनी ही बड़ी कंपनीज को उन्होंने लोन दिया होगा और इन केस इफ देर इज अ क्राइसिस a bank which has lent to bigger businesses has more chances of going down has more chances of getting failed as compared to a smaller bank because usually the small banks they lend to retail customers or individual customers chote banks kya karte hain zyada tar aam insaan ko loan dete hain chote mote loans dete hain to agar wo pay back nahi bhi karte to unko zyada farak nahi padta but bade banks ke situation mein agar bahut badi companies let's say If Reliance takes a loan from a big bank and run away, runs away with all the money, then what is going to happen? This is going to this 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 has the ability to destroy a big bank, right? So larger banks they are more vulnerable. So if by merger we increase the scale of bank, we might make them more vulnerable. Merger could only give a temporary relief, but not a real remedy to problems. So just as the partner cannot fulfill all the deficiencies. of the other partner in similar ways banks have to improve upon themselves right so let's say if one person in the marriage is really lazy and other one is really hard working then for temporary basis they might be able to work it out but after some time it would be create it would create some problems amongst their understanding so the lazy person would have to improve upon themselves rather than getting dependent upon the hard working one similarly bad banks or the banks who are facing the problems will have to make some permanent changes some support or help from a bigger bank or a profitable bank can all can only help them for a particular time period or just for a while not in permanent sense coping with staffers disappointment so this is one of the major point let's say this boy and this girl they get married but their families are not happy with their alliance so in this situation it is going to be really difficult for them to adjust with each other's families so if these banks they are getting merged but their staff is not happy so you can compare this staff to the families of both of them right so they have to keep the families happy as well so unhappy staff can lead to many problems for the bank in case they are not happy with the alliance in case they are not happy with the merger this can lead to employment issues right so this is an overview of merger advantages and disadvantages of merger of a bank right okay this is the second question the second question says RBI has recently penalized Bajaj Finance Limited with rupees 2.5 crores what was the reason behind it right moving ahead to the correct option correct option for this question is option b option b means bajaj finances recovery agents have indulged into harassment of borrowers so are so guys if you remember the session we had on digital lending in india right we were talking about how there are many companies which are coming up online और ये जो online companies होती हैं ये बहुत आसानी से ही लोगों को loan दे देते हैं ज़्यादा पूछताछ नहीं करते ना ही ज़्यादा documents मांगते हैं आप normally if you go to a bank and you ask for a loan they are going to ask everything to you they are going to probably ask you to put up a collateral of your house just for a uh, loan of रुपी फोर lakh or फाइव lakh right so अगर आप एक छोटा सा भी loan लेने जाते हो तो हो सकता है आपसे बहुत बड़ा collateral मांग दिया जाए but if you lend if you borrow from an online lender they might not ask you much formal they might not ask you for fulfilling much formalities right but the point here is so these digital lenders they provide easy access to credit but they can really uh, they can harass their borrowers real bad in case they are not able to pay back so we discussed one of the scam that has been pl- taking place in the country where there was uh, there were there were uh, some companies run by some um people who are who were having links to china right so the roots uh, they they went back to china so 
ये क्या करते थे ये कुछ कंपनीज बना के लोन देते थे लोगों को और अगर वो लोन को वापस नहीं कर पाते थे इन केस दे आर बोरवर्स वर नॉट एबल टू पे बैक दे यूज टू हैरेस दी बोरवर्स इन वन इन वन ऑफ द केस व्हाट दे यूज टू डू वाज दे दे सेंड सम बैड मैसेजेस टू फैमिली एंड फ्रेंड्स ऑफ द बोरवर्स राइट फ्रॉम देयर ओन फोन नंबर्स बाय हैकिंग देयर डिवाइसेस बाय यूजिंग देयर डेटा बाय और बाय मिस यूजिंग देयर डेटा सो मिस यूजिंग इज अ बेटर वर्ड दे मिस यूज द डेटा एंड बेसिकली बैड माउथेड और इंसल्टेड दीज पीपल दीज बोरवर्स इन फ्रंट ऑफ देयर फैमिलीज और फ्रेंड्स मेनी पीपल कमिटेड सुसाइड आउट ऑफ इट एंड देन आर बी आई टूक सम Uh, strict actions against it so one company that has been fined for it is bajaj finance limited because their recovery agents were also harassing the borrowers so for this rbi has put up a fine see doing recovery is a normal process agar aapne kisi ko loan diya hai to obviously aap paise to wapas mangoge hi after a point of time but harassing them in such a bad way or making their lives miserable may and driving them towards towards the point of taking their own life is not an ethical way to do it right that is why rbi rbi is trying to protect the borrowers from harassment here you can see some details regarding it recovery agents in so basically this bajaj finance failed at making sure that recovery agents did not harass borrowers this nbfc reported assets under management of 1.04 trillion so you can see the scale at which nbfcs are lending right move assumes significance at a time there have been customer complaints right so although bajaj finance is a very known company it is not uh, sm on a smaller level or, or like a digital lender but still rbi is becoming stricter against the harassment bulk of these lending apps not registered as nbfcs complicating a regulatory list the problem is that there is a gray area for regulation of such lenders that is why even regulators are confused what to do with them and they take time in taking some strict actions penalty has been imposed in exercise of powers vested in rbi under this provision you can see that reserve bank of india act 1934 powers rbi to take actions against such activities moving ahead to the next question okay this is the third question and the third question says rbi has decided to introduce legal entity identifier system for all payment transactions of value dash and above undertaken by entities using rtgs and nift right see the correct option for this question is option d that is 50 crores guys i hope you remember all these terms because they have been discussed in previous session legal entity identifier rtgs and nift right rtgs and nift they are modes of payment through which you can make online payments now what is this legal identity like legal entity identifier before coming to that do you remember in school all these students they use they usually have a roll number why are the students given a roll number because then it is easier for school to identify the students and keep a track of all their transactions right so this legal entity identifier this is nothing short of a roll number or an identity number that is provided to uh, entities who undertake financial transactions so ye jitni bhi badi badi companies hain ya jitne bade banks hain insurance companies hain basically jo bhi financial transaction kar raha hai usko identify karne ke liye hum ek number de dete hain simply ek ek tarike se ek roll number de dete hain taki unko easily identify kiya ja sake so basically this is an international mode of identification right we have discussed this term in detail if you want to go deeper you can ask for its link in the comments so now what rbi is saying that let us give this number let us give lei to all the entities who are making a transaction using rtgs and nift of more than 50 crores so agar koi bhi aisi entity hai non individual hai matlab company hai बेसिकली एक इंसान नहीं है कोई एंटिटी है कोई एस्टैब्लिशमेंट है 
who is doing a transaction of more than 50 crores using RTGS and NEF, in that case, it should have a legal entity identifier, right? Here you can see, so guys in the session where we discussed about LEI, we, uh, we learned about how RBI was trying to implement uh, its, its implement, uh, implement its validity in different phases. You can go back to the session if you want to know about those dates. So what is LEI? 20 digit number used to identify parties who are indulging into financial transactions worldwide. Key measure to improve quality and accuracy of financial data, right? Introduced by RBI in a phased manner for participants in over-the-counter transactions and non-derivative markets and also for large borrowers. So some parties, some areas where RBI has introduced LEI. It has now been decided to introduce LEI system for all payment transactions of 50 crore. We just uh, learned it. So here you can see RBI has given some operational guidelines. Advise entities who undertake large value transactions to obtain LEI in time if they do not already have one. So if you don't have LEI and you are doing a big transaction, then RBI is saying that you can take this number quickly or you can go ahead and problem can happen. Include remitter and beneficiary LEI information in RTGS and NEFT payments. So whenever someone is doing a payment through RTGS or NEFT, they have to provide the details of remitter, someone who is providing the money and beneficiary who is receiving the money. In a financial transaction, mein kya hota hai? someone sends the money and someone receives the money. So remitter and beneficiary, both of their LEI number, LEI information has to be provided. Maintain records of all transactions, right? Now, from where you can take this LEI? From any local operating units accredited by Global Legal Ed Entity Identifier Foundation. So, this is an uh, organization, a foundation which, which authorizes these smaller units to provide LEIs, right? In India, it can also be obtained from Legal Entity Ident Identifier India limited right so simple enough moving ahead to next question question number four which says select the statement which is correct about index investing right simple enough correct option option e guys index investing if you remember in a recent session we talked about an index that rbi is going to create that was called rbi dpi digital payment index in that, I told you what is the meaning of an index, right? In brief, when we have many elements and we want to know their performance, what we do is we combine them in a form just as you have percentage which tells you uh, an average performance in all of these subjects, right? Similarly, there is an index which tells you about performance of different elements in a combined form. Now, coming to an investment technique that is index investing. Index investing means investing into a scheme, into a fund which is following a particular market index. It can be Sensex, it can be Nifty, right? Or it can be any international index like SNP, right? <coughs> Sorry. So basically, trying to put your money into all the companies that are part of a certain index is called index investing, right? Now, what you are doing through this is you are trying to follow the market. See, these indices, be it Sensex or Nifty, they give you an idea of performance of market. हम कहते हैं कि Sensex ऊपर जा रहा है तो market ऊपर जा रहा है. मतलब businesses को फायदा हो रहा है. एक तरीके से एक indication है. Right? Same goes for Nifty. So, if you are investing into companies which make this Sensex up, then obviously you are trying to move with market. So, that is what index investing is. You can do it through some mutual funds, index mutual funds. Or you can do it through ETFs. These are exchange traded funds. Right? 
Guys, we have discussed the difference between ETFs and index funds in one of our previous sessions. I hope you remember it. <coughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Now coming to the statements. Index investment, active investing technique. Nahi hai, not an active investment technique. It's a passive one because see, here you are just putting your money into an index and that is all you have to do. You do not have to monitor that whether this company is going up or down or not. You are just, see your investment is going to change. If one company becomes the part of index and one company uh, exits from it, then obviously your investment is going to change automatically because the investment managers are making it sure, right? So basically you do not have to uh, buy shares or shell, sell shares on a regular basis. You just have to invest your money and sit quietly and wait for the results. So that is why it's a passive technique. Advantage of index investing is that investors get a chance to beat the market which are being generated by the market. No, you cannot beat the market because what you are doing is following the market. If you want to beat the market, then you have to invest in certain stocks, certain shares which you think have more growth than this index, than this, than the companies who are part of these index, right? So you cannot beat the market because you are following the market. This is one disadvantage of index investing that you cannot beat the market. You do not have a chance. If you want to beat it, then do not follow passive strategy, follow an active strategy. Works on the principle that index is more volatile than a single company or a group of company. This is also not right because index is more stable or you can say it is less volatile than a single stock because let's say if you have invested all your money into let's say Tata right you have put all your money into Tata shares what if Tata's shares fell down then what is going to happen is you are going to lose money but if you have put your money into an index let's say Sensex basically a scheme which invests into all the companies of Sensex then Let's say Tata forms part of this Sensex. Then if Tata goes down, there are many other companies. So Sensex comprises of 30 companies. There are, in, there are many other companies and if they rise in value, they can compensate for the loss of Tata. So your investments are diversified. That is why your lo loss is also mitigated, right? So that is why index indices are less volatile than a single stock because the single stock can move up or down but index is going to compensate for loss of one by profits of another <coughs> okay moving ahead to next statement which says index investing schemes can charge a hefty fees from the investors this is also not true because they charge less because they charge less fees as compared to other active schemes because see even managers they don't have to worry much about which company to buy which which to sell because they just have to follow an index and they do not have to worry too much about it that is why there is not much work involved and they <coughs> charge less fees from the investors so this is a correct statement because passive investing is <coughs> is a low risk approach or index investing is a low risk approach right here are some other details i think we have discussed it in summary we'll just run through it passive investment technique attempts to generate returns similar to market or follow the market buy and hold strategy to replicate the performance of an index they do not buy and sell frequently buy and hold just buy a stock and keep holding it Low risk approach, since index is less volatile than a single company. <coughs> less likely for the market to collapse as a whole than it is for individual companies. Since such instruments are passively managed, not a very high fees, implies giving up any chance of beating the index by stock. So this is one disadvantage that you cannot beat the market. So while picking up an ETF or index funds, you should know that what is this fund investing into. It might invest into a certain type of shares, just like it might invest into certain PSUs 
and you might not want your money going into PSUs. So you should study before that where this money goes into of this index, right? Moving ahead to next question. Okay, this question says RBI has recently announced operational guidelines for PIDF scheme. According to these guidelines, what will be the contribution of card network towards PIDF? Correct option for this question is option C. That means 0 0.01 paisa per rupee of transaction. Guys, I hope you remember about PIDF. That is Payment Infrastructure Development Fund. We have discussed about it in one of our previous sessions. So it's very simple. It's just a fund, just a collection of money that RBI has saved and it is going to use this money for development of payment infrastructure, especially helping merchants or small businesses to have POS machines, right? So this is RBI a saving, a different fund, which we will use in the country to payment infrastructure so that you can easily do online payments. If you go to any merchant, they have a POS machine or UPI so that your payment is easy. So to promote it, to boost this, RBI has come up with PIDF, right? So now RBI has provided some guidelines. Here you can see. Here you can see the validity, right? It is valid for a period of three years and can be extended to two more years depending upon the requirement. Presently has a corpus of 345 crore, 250 crore. So guys, when we earlier discussed PIDF, we discussed that 250 crore is going to be RBI's contribution to this fund. And rest is being put up by different companies. Authorized card networks. Which are the card networks? Networks which allow payments to be done, just as Visa, Mastercard, or Europay or Rupay, right? Rupay is the Indian term in this. So here you can see some targets. Basically, RBI wants to develop such payment infrastructure in tier three, tier four cities and northeastern states, right? In metro cities, though, there is already a culture of UPI payments and online payments. They want to do it in smaller areas. So this tells you the percentage of fund going into each type of center. For example, northeastern states will be having 10% of this fund. Payment methods that are not interoperable. Guys, I hope you remember the meaning of interoperability. We have discussed in the session where we discussed about QR codes. If you are not aware, you can ask for its link in the comments. So payment methods that are not interoperable, RBI is not going to promote them. That is why not considered under this fund. Okay. Here you can see, basically you can see how, see, I told you in the earlier session as well, some money is going to be put up by RBI, some money is going to be put up by card networks and some money is going to be put up by card issuing banks. So these are simply banks that give you card, be it SBI, BOB or um, HDFC can be any bank. So this is, the, this is the contribution you can see here, card networks they will contribute 0.01% per rupee. So let's say if they are doing a transaction worth rupees 1 rupee then they are going to give 0.01% paisa to this fund contribute to this particular fund because ultimately they are going to take the benefit out of the activities conducted from this money card issuing banks they will provide this much of contribution i think this is just some information factual information you can read upon your own nothing much to uh, nothing too much conceptual 1 and 3 for every new debit or credit card they issue. Guys, see, if, he, if there is any term that you are not aware of, because see the basic terms like debit cards, credit cards, we usually discuss them in our previous, we have already discussed them in our previous sessions. So if you are not aware of certain terms, then please ask for their meanings, right? Because I assume we have discussed certain terms in previous sessions as well. So if you are not aware, you can always ask for their meaning in the comments or you can ask for the links of the session where they were discussed and if there is going to be any shortfall in the fund RBI is going to cover it here you can see the subsidy see the basic use of this fund the, the money collected under this fund is going to be subsidized the purchase of POS machine by the merchants 
POS machine, point of sales machine, you must have seen this machine while making online payments, sorry, uh, payments using cards. So you can see the matrix. So if there is one particular city that lies in this category, tier 3, tier 4 centers, there, if there is a physical payment acceptance device, if there is a device that has to be put up to accept payments, 30% cost is going to be subsidized. Right? And if it's a digital acceptance device, then probably 50% is going to be subsidized. So this table tells you about different subsidy provisions of RBI under this fund. Right? So guys, these were the five questions for today. I hope you learned something new from this video. If you did, then do not forget to give us a thumbs up because I'll be back in next session with some new information. Till then, you guys take care, keep studying and thank you for being here.